Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all for spending part of your day to attend our webinar, uh, How Analytics Can Bring a Talent Management Suite to Life. Uh, we hope it uh, um, is a good use of your time and uh, give you a good glimpse into the analytics space, uh, particularly throughout HR. Um, little agenda, what we're going to cover today. We'll give you the very uh, briefest overview on uh, our sponsor, which is uh, our company, Trend Data. Uh, what we do and how we play into this space. And then I'll give you a little background on analytics. There's a lot of uh, terms being thrown around in um, particularly in analytics regarding this space. And I wanted to bring a definition of exactly what's what and how, how it breaks down into the various uh, market that we're working in right now. And that'll bring us right to the uh, meat of today's presentation, which will be targeted around talent analytics. And then we'll give a little um, explanation of how artificial intelligence has actually been contributing um, to uh, the acceleration of this market. And then we'll do a demonstration and answer some questions. Uh, just for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Tom McEwen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Trend Data. I'll be presenting the material today. Once again, appreciate your attendance. Uh, Trend Data. So we are headquartered in Plano, Texas. Uh, that's a northern suburb of Dallas, uh, barely 10-minute drive. Our company has been around since 2016, but we launched our first product in 2017. So our, our uh, people analytics solution has been on the market for over a year now. We sell pre predominantly to uh, corporate clients. Our people analytics solution is uh, artificial intelligence driven, AI driven, and it is a cloud SaaS offering. So all you really need to, um, to operate the solution is a browser. There's no on-site implementation. It is a cloud SaaS based solution. A uh, quick glimpse at just some of our clients here. Um, this is just a sprinkling of some. We always try to spread them across a couple of industries to give you an idea of uh, uh, where we have clients, and if you eventually want to do business with us, uh, we can let you talk to someone on or close to your own space where you can get an idea on how they're using the solution. So let's talk about analytics. Um, particularly in the human resources space, there's been a lot of, uh, I'd say, uh, what a prefix words to analytics. Uh, we've got people analytics, HR analytics, <laughs> workforce analytics, talent analytics. Um, and unfortunately, people tend to use them interchangeably. Uh, in some instances, that might be correct, but uh, they, they are actually um, slightly different in what they um, actually accomplish. So I wanted to tick through each of them and give you an idea where um, uh, they're most often used. And we'll start with the most generic um, term, HR analytics, uh, just human resource analytics. Um, it actually, as far as analytics in the human resource uh, software space, is actually the most common used term of uh, being in this space and you know working with search engines. We find that HR analytics is actually the most common uh, search term for analytics in the space. Not, not totally surprising, being it's HR human resource software that people might use. Um, and it's often used interchangeably with the other three, people, workforce, and talent analytics. Unfortunately, um, it's become more of a catch-all phrase for anybody who has a dashboard. So um, often when you're uh, talking about analytics, possibly to a novice who hasn't um, uh, really delved into the topic much, they're always like, well, doesn't uh, ADP, SAP, Ultimate, uh, Workday, don't they have analytics? And generally what you see is they have dashboards. And a dashboard doesn't necessarily mean you have analytics. What it most often means is you have metrics metrics being that snapshot in time and not the trending and forecasting that comes with analytics. So first uh, thing to watch out for is any vendor that tells you, hey, here's our dashboard, we have analytics. It's actually not uh, what analytics is. Um, to get an idea what analytics is and where it came from, particularly in this space, uh, I wanna go back a few years and start with kind of two competing not competing, parallel uh, technologies in the um, HR space. The HR space was, of course, uh, uh, really born with uh, the birth of the HRIS, which was PeopleSoft and SAP. But about 10, uh, 10 15 years ago, a couple of competing technologies came on the rise, uh, workforce planning and talent management. And it was really out of these two uh, solutions that we started to really make the foray into analytics. Going to look at them one at a time. The first one being workforce planning. 
And what the workforce planning is, is essentially um, any solution that gives you ability to plan the future needs of your workforce. And really what that was, was the ability to visualize. And it started with really just basic org charts. People wanted to put together a hierarchy of their organization, who reports to who, um, and go all the way up. And at least you'd see um, you know, what your organization looked like. Um, and then uh, this started evolving a little bit with what you could actually do with the hierarchy. For example, um, first people were doing people to people reporting, and then they started doing position to position reporting. And that allowed you to show where you had open positions in the organization, which further helped you visualize. Um, and then you could start putting other factors in there, what department somebody was in, maybe what their salary was. And then what you could do eventually is roll up all that data and get some top line statistics. How many people do you have in finance? How many people do you have in marketing? How many people do you have uh, in this salary bracket? Or how many people do you have in um, uh, a particular skill set uh, and location? So this was, a, you can see how this could kind of be somewhat of a precursor of what we're talking about analytics. But again, it was pretty much snapshot in time in that it could tell you everything you have now, um, but it didn't get the evolution. Uh, similarly, uh, the other technology that's kind of moved into this is that of talent management. And this is the uh, uh, having solutions that have the ability to help you recruit, hire, retain, and develop, you know, your most talented employees. Um, and you can see down there you have a, an example of the uh, talent management life cycle from when someone is recruited into the organization, moves through onboarding, training, performance measurement, and then career development or succession planning. And what happened as you went through every phase of this process is you needed some kind of metric, and some companies called them dashlets, of where, what was going on at each stage. You know, how many candidates did you have in the pipeline? How many were hired last month? Um, how many people you know, are in your succession plan? Um, and what levels of career development you have? But again, you're looking all at snapshots, but you could see the um, benefit of being able to see uh, what happened when someone came in, then had um, uh, an onboard particular type of training, how did they perform and how did they move in the organization? And that could give you some future roadmap as to who your best and future leaders are going to become. So tying those two technologies together and then bringing in kind of the really the component uh, HR always tends to forget, which is the financial component. Um, I've been selling these two technologies, talent management, workforce planning, and now analytics for probably going on almost 20 years. And uh, HR always wants to be able to give a financial impact to it, but um, always tends to leave that part out when they do their planning. And it always leaves them kind of out of the budget and the leadership positions um, because they're often treated as an expense where their solutions are brought in to make things better, but not necessarily grow the business. But if you kind of look at um, what kind of numbers you're dealing with, with uh, um, people decisions, you, know, you just have to bring up a list of uh, revenue per employee for the top uh, companies in the S&P. So these are the top 500 companies in the S&P, S&P, and that RPE 2017 is the revenue per employee in millions for each of these companies. I was actually surprised by this list. I was thinking it was gonna be more technology heavy, but you can see it's more heavy in energy, particularly um, healthcare a little bit and financials. Uh, this probably would be a slightly different list if you had uh, net profit per employees, because a lot of these industries have a lot of um, costs that go with, um, uh, with um, uh, you know, these employees. But you know, take that top one, Valero Energy, who's looking at something like over $9 million um, per revenue per employee. So basically with that, you can kind of um, uh, calculate from that is, if that position goes empty for four months, a third of a year, you're talking about $3.1 million in loss to the company. And if you go over to the right, where I've put up just a typical turnover stat from the last year, turnover in 2017 averaged about 18.5% for companies and it's projected to go over 20% uh, once the final 2018 numbers are in. So you can be sure that uh, more than one seat was going empty at these companies, maybe not for an entire four months. If you calculate the average time to fill an open position, 
Uh, but you can see there's a lot of money tied up. So it's not very difficult to then take um, what you have in um, uh, HR, movement of employees, turnover, recruiting, and all these different aspects and tie them into numbers. So when you bring all that together, um, the workforce planning, the talent management, the financial impact, and you want to project with these, that's where you get to uh, what we call people analytics. And people analytics is simply the ability to take data from multiple data sources, uh, so you have a holistic picture. Um, uh, HR organizations tend to have multiple data sources. Often they have a talent management, an HRIS, a workforce planning, sometimes a separate recruiting system. Uh, so there's generally the um, a need to bring in data from multiple sources. Then being able to take those, metri those metrics, those snapshots, those dashlets from all of these technologies and trend them, which is what analytics is, being able to see the, the patterns as you're going forward. And then the fact that you're bringing in data from all of these sources, you can now start to filter by um, uh, different uh, factors from other systems. So you might bring in turnover from your HRIS system, but you can bring in performance from your talent system and see where your high performers going. Or you might bring in recruiting from your recruiting system and be able to bring in something like ethnicity again, which might be in your HRIS system, and be able to see if you're um, recruiting a diverse workforce. Um, and then with all that history of data that you have, uh, you can then start doing the predictive forecasting. Well, if things were going this way the last 12 months, what's to say they're not going to continue that, at least for the next 6 to 12 months, but also giving you the historical snapshots to be able to build models. So then you can say, all right, well, things will keep going up. But last time things were going up, we did this, and it started to go down. And being able to then forecast and predict scenarios where you can improve the future of the business. And then also being able to incorporate the financial impact. So uh, bringing in the financial numbers, uh, cost per hire, revenue per employee, benefits information, all this stuff. And then you can tie numbers, as we showed on the prior slide, to uh, what happens when you lose someone? What happens when you lose a high performer? What happens when you lose 20 high performers? And then the final kind of the newest kicker, which is really um, taking this to the next level, is da -da -da, drum roll, um, the ability to incorporate artificial intelligence uh, into uh, analytics and um, and predictive scenarios. Now, uh, you hear a lot about AI these days, artificial intelligence, and everybody pretty much uh, tries to incorporate in everything they do. And it doesn't mean you're going to have transformers coming into your office. But really what uh, AI does is, um, if you think what the goal of ERP software was originally, it was to automate a manual process. And what AI does, um, is allowed that if that process is bad, it doesn't have to be corrected with human intervention. It'll correct itself as it continues to operate. So if you look at um, uh, the trend data, for example, talent management platform, you know we're able to do this intelligent data gathering. So the system can go out and grab the piece of data that you need uh, to calculate any metric or analytic. And it can pull from multiple systems within your internal uh, HR ecosphere but also the ability to go out and grab uh, big data sources like salary surveys or benchmark information or anything that you might pull from a, um, you know, maybe a non-vendor type place where you can pull to compare to what your internal averages are. We'll show you how we use natural language processing, which is the ability um, to uh, not have to step through menus, but use a natural word search to find what you want in the um, system itself. Uh, consumer businesses seem to always be way ahead of um, business-to-business uh, business solutions. You know, right now in Google, you can pretty much just type in, you know, where's the nearest pizza place, and it'll bring it up. We bring that kind of technology to um, software solutions. And then finally, we talked about the predictive modeling, which uh, uses historical data to be able to um, uh, fashion and model out future scenarios. Where the AI component comes in is every time you do one of these processes, the system learns whether it was a good or a bad process. So take the natural language, for example. Um, you might be continually using a phrase uh, that um, uh, might have a synonym. And as you continually use them in the same things, the system is eventually going to pick up that you know these two words pretty much mean the same. And same thing for the modeling. If you keep running modeling scenarios 
and the um, 95% it comes out with the same uh, answer, the system's gonna get into what we call prescriptive uh, analytics where you're not even running the models anymore, the system runs them for you and then you actually are able to just get the answers by typing in the question. So as we kind of work backwards, um, we've got um, uh, people analytics at the top and then we've worked up to it through workforce planning and talent management those actual subsets of people analytics actually have their own analytics involved with them. So you've got in the talent space, um, the ability to have um, you know, recruiting, performing, succession, career data, and be able to uh, plan analytics around those, but also able to bring in those workforce statistics like headcount, tenure, age, turnover, and be able to actually filter and cross uh, analyze them with each other. And then being able to um, then also bring in the data from your financial systems, such as revenue per employee, maybe cost per hire, um, compensation and benefits information, all sorts of financial data where you can then tie revenue per employee to loss of uh, to headcount, and then what happens when you're, how do you calculate that for a high performer? So each of these subsets can have their own uh, analytics base, but it's most powerful when you bring them all together in what we call people analytics so that you can in fact um, show not only talent, workforce, and finance by themselves, but the ability to bring them all in together and uh, show a holistic view on how all of these factors are affecting uh, the growth and success of your company. What you see right now is a, um, a half-constructed uh, dashboard of uh, our people analytics solution at Trend Data. Um, we, uh, have a, both an out of the box and an enterprise version of our solution. Our solution comes with 20 uh, different uh, metrics out of the box. Uh, we can bring in information for pretty much any data source, um, uh, whether it's an HRIS system, um, uh, a talent management, or a, um, a recruiting system. And you can also put uh, multiple uh, data sources so you can incorporate information from any of them that'll eventually bring you to the point where you have all of your t data together. And if you need some kind of a filter to be able to, to say, maybe an employee ID on one supersedes another, the system provides that very easily. But let me go back to the dashboard and just kind of show you how to navigate the system. So let's kind of look at uh, performance right now. We'll start with that in the talent space. So right now the system as a metric is telling you that you have um, performance scores, uh, either NA is people who, uh, uh, we're too early in the company to take a uh, to get a performance appraisal. And then you have other people raising, uh, 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 getting scores anywhere from two to five. Nobody in the one because that's probably low enough where you might uh, um, not not make the next round of the company. Now, if I drill down on performance scores, um, it's going to give me a little deeper look at that information. So it's giving me the average performance score in the various departments in the organization. And if I wanted to show something else, like perhaps uh, uh, by location, I can do that. Um, but what I really wanted to show off here is the ability uh, to change the metric. So uh, if any of you have worked with any of the BI tools or um, Tableau or anything, if you wanted to change this to a different look, you would have to go into a table, do a bunch of configuration. Uh, we solve all of that by natural language search. So suppose I didn't want to see the average score for every department, but I wanted to see who's in the various buckets. So I could just simply type in a natural language command. Um, and what that's going to do is then let me break this up by, by um, uh, department and by performance score. And when I go through the uh, uh, search, you can see now instead it's giving me um, a breakdown by bucket as to where everybody in these departments are. Um, now since this was a, a, a system generated search, uh, it's gonna ask me was this the result that I was looking for? And uh, in fact, yes, this was the result I was looking for. And then I could just simply click, click yes. If I click no, it's gonna ask for uh, what I was looking for and it's gonna feed that back into the system. And the next time I ask that query, it's going to give me uh, what I was looking for. So I'll just say yes for now and uh, give you an idea of what we can do. Now, if I wanted to add this to the dashboard, 
I could just go ahead and do that and it'll give me a number of different um, graph choices that I could use to add it to the, uh, the, the, the dashboard. So very easy use of the natural language solution, no swapping up tables, changing X and Y axis, just easy access from the natural language solution. Um, now moving on from performance, let's take a look at source of hire, and this can show you a little bit on, on that global filtering capability. So for example, uh, this is showing me just a snapshot in time this month. I got 18.5% of my recruits from LinkedIn, uh, but 37% I got from the various job boards. Uh, let's look at this analytically and see if that holds out over the last uh, measured time period. So if I click on the analytics, it's going to say for the last 12 months, this is where I've been getting most of my people from. So it looks like from numbers, except for this one outlier here, the majority of the time I'm getting most of my um, employees from um, job boards. And I can go back and actually um, expand this, uh, tighten this search if I wanted to look at by um, number of years aggregated over a couple of years. I can quickly hit um, the five year and I can even change it to a percent if I would like. And it's gonna tell me pretty consistently I'm getting most of my hires from, uh, from job boards. Now, if I were just pulling this from a recruiting system, this would be pretty much all I have. But the fact that we're aggregating data from multiple systems, I can go to an expanded filter system, which has a number of different ways that I can um, um, filter this information, one of them which is performance. So if I wanna see maybe where I'm getting my top performers from, so the fours and fives, I just enable those. And what it's gonna tell me is a slightly different story. Looks like uh, historically now, the people who've performed best at the company have come from LinkedIn with probably a competitive second from employee referrals, whereas job boards has actually um, been much, uh, much lighter. And you can see down here at the bottom, we have a filtered look at the various people who are in these pockets. So what it gives me is a listing of all my top performers. I can decide um, you know, what columns I wanna look at, what I don't wanna look at. If I, of course, they're current employees, so they don't have a termination date, so I can take that out. And if I wanted to, I could just dump all this information to a, a CSV file. Um, I can also, if I wanted to, any time in the system, whether it's one view or an entire dashboard, um, I can download that system. I can download that chart to um, uh, any type of uh, uh, view and send that out to um, someone else in the organization, if I liked, or outside of the organization. So um, global filtering and being able to um, trend um, very useful going forward as to trying to get where your best employees from. Now bringing in the financial capabilities, um, I'm gonna use the um, uh, natural language search again to show you both um, uh, how to create a metric, find a metric, and also incorporate big data. So um, if I wanted to look at what's the average compensation by job level, um, you can see I've done this query before and it's typing it out for me. If I type, if I click on what's the average compensation by job level, what it's gonna do is bring up a graph that shows me uh, this is what all my directors average getting paid. This is what all my executive VPs, my vice presidents, my staff, which is a nice uh, view of what uh, is going on. Now, I might think I'm paying all these people great salaries just by looking at the numbers, uh, but if I wanted to find out uh, what's going on versus the industry, as I said, we can quickly in incorporate information from um, external data sources like salary surveys. So if I go, you know, what's the average uh, compensation by job level compared to industry averages. When I do that query, you'll see it's now gonna go out and grab some salary data, and now it's gonna populate right next to my um, current compensations, um, how much I'm pay paying people versus industry averages. So you can see in most categories, I'm actually above the industry averages, more about even here at the staff level, but pretty much um, I'm paying above the industry average, which uh, uh, is probably good. And um, maybe that's um, gonna be helpful in keeping people on board. Well, we'll see as we go a little further down in the demonstration. Now the last um, talent aspect I did wanna look at is um, succession planning. 
So it's very easy to um, take a look and see how, what percent of your um, uh, positions are actually staffed. If I do a drill down, it's going to show me my top levels, the um, vice president, president, and executive VPs. Uh, the actual numbers might not be as useful as the percentages. And it's going to tell me 100% of my EVPs are staffed with successors, uh, as well as president, which is only one, and uh, vice president. So I'm pretty good at um, uh, who I've got staffed. And I can also bring up a list down here, which will show me um, how many successors I have going backwards. So it looks like um, everybody's got one successor. Maybe over here I have probably about five people. Looks like all vice presidents, six people who don't have a level three successor. Um, so let's see what the, what's actually gone on in that. So we can go again to the analytics. And as I move forward, it's going to show me the trend of these various positions. And you can see that um, the, the uh, successor for um, uh, vice presidents has kind of trended down over the last um, 12 months. And again, some insight from that. Uh, if these people were getting promoted, uh, then these positions might start going up. So this might be telling me that my vice presidents are, um, uh, their successes are actually leaving the co company, uh, which might be a bit of a warning sign that I have to start looking at uh, either recruiting from the outside or promoting some more people to fill this uh, succession pipeline. So moving forward, um, the, uh, one of the things we want to talk about is being how difficult it is to staff. So this is very good analytical information. Uh, we can actually pull up a metric that shows um, staffing difficulty for um, key positions. Uh, if I drill down, it's going to show me that um, right now I have 59 positions where I have a high staffing difficulty and 34 positions where I have a very high staffing difficulty. And again, you can pull up all of this information by um, a grid down here at the bottom. And you can see we actually calculate a retention score uh, based on historicals for that position, the particular individual in the position, and various other factors that'll tell you why that's a particularly um, uh, difficult position to staff. Again, going with the analytics, we can take a look down the line and see that um, we may actually have been doing a pretty good job because the number of positions that have high staffing uh, high staffing difficulty have gone down a little bit over the last 12 months and uh, also um, a little bit uh, on the uh, very high. That's possibly due to some training we've been doing or um, some other factors. Which brings us down to the last thing I want to talk about, tying all, all this into something as uh, global-wide as turnover. So again, I'm going to go back to the natural language capabilities and see um, if I can pull up some information on turnover. So a generic question might be, how is turnover trending? And this gives you kind of an idea of how nuanced the natural language search can be. It doesn't have to be you know, totally exact science. So if I ask how is turnover trending, what the system is going to do is uh, give me um, what turnover has been looking like the last couple of months. And you can see this is a bit of an alarming trend. Uh, turnover has, in fact, been on the rise. Um, might want to drill into that a little deeper. Is that um, uh, something to be concerned with, did, or did we just let some low performers win? So you can actually ask another question, which would be, you know, do I have a turnover problem? And again, the system's going to kind of use past language to uh, to determine what it, what might be a problem. So if I do this particular um, query, uh, the system's going to break it down into voluntary and involuntary turnover. And here is where I can start to see um, I do have a rise in involuntary turnover, uh, which is means people are leaving that I'm not letting go. So these are possibly people that I don't want to see leaving the company. Um, I can look at this a number of ways, like I did in the, <clears throat> in the other filters, if I wanted to say, is this correlating with high performers? So if I go by performer, I'll see like a similar pattern somewhere around January here. I started to see high performers start rising as leaving the company. Now, what's something that uh, you know could have caused that? Uh, being able to incorporate events like uh, what might have happened during those 12 months, uh, we can type in and see. Well, actually, in October, November, we completed um, an acquisition 
of um, uh, another company. And it was really about 30 days after that, the high performers started leaving at the beginning of the year. Might be they'd just gotten a big bonus check in December, or it might be that these high performers, uh, thinking their career was on the rise, uh, the acquisition of another company might have put a lot, new layer of management in that'll prevent some of these people to getting where their career wants them to go. Um, that's, of course, all supposition, but let's go into the predictive mode and see if that actually uh, pans out. So as I move into the predictive, I can see that uh, turnover continues to rise. These blue ones are the current months. And then the system is projecting, based on historical data, that turnover is actually going to continue to rise up to a, a rather unhealthy level of 6% um, monthly, which if you aggregate that, that's, that's about 50% turnover per year. Is that also uh, continuing for the high performers? Actually, it looks like it's getting worse for the high performers. That's going to skyrocket here in October to a very dangerous level. Now, it looks like it uh, forecasts sort of a flattening and maybe a gradual decline, um, but uh, still, I don't think anybody's happy with that level of turnover, and particularly <clears throat> that level of high performer turnover. So let's kind of see if there's something we could do um, to fix this. So I'm going to move from this individual view, which I've been showing off, to our summary view. And what this gives us is a look at um, a lot of the statistics around turnover. Um, you know, the, what we've been paying people, what we had to do to recruit, and then it breaks turnover down as up here into high performer and non high performer turnover. Um, and it can also tie in the financial statistics as well, what you're losing with those people leaving. So let me um, go into the modeling capabilities and what are the factors we can actually control here. So, uh, you know, I could give people more money. Uh, um, we did see at the beginning that we were paying our people pretty close to um, uh, industry averages. But what happens if, say, I give um, an average $5,000 raise to the whole organization? Um, did you see anything move? Well, not much. Uh, turnover went down about 0.2 of 1%. So it's a thousand person organization. I spent $5,000 for employee that was $5 million to barely make a dent in any of the turnover. So maybe that's not the move right now. Maybe that does bear out by the fact that we um, are paying pretty close to industry averages. So I'll put that back to where it is. Now we do let a lot of people work from home. Uh, that seems to have been a pretty popular policy. We've got about a third of our employees working there. What if I increase that? What kind of message would that send? So if I let more people work from home, uh, I could see that turnover started to drop a little bit. It went down from a little over a point, maybe a point, point two. Um, and it really, I didn't have to spend that much money just letting people work from home. Now, depending on your business, you may not be able to let that many people work from home. But based on this business, the system is saying, uh, yeah, you might want to keep rising that, maybe at too aggressive a rate, but uh, um, this might be able to affect a good bit of your employee rates. But over here, you can see it really didn't do what we want to this high performer turnover, which uh, way back in April was you know, very low. So as we look into the final factor, we look at the high performers in professional development. Uh, we have less than 7% of our stellar employees in any kind of professional training. So you take that, combine it with the fact that we just acquired a company that probably brought in a ton of new managers. Perhaps these people are saying, well, you know, I'm making decent money here, but my career is not going anywhere, so uh, perhaps it's time to move on. Well, what kind of a message can we send? Well, what if we take that money we were going to throw into raises and put it into professional development? So if I double that and put it up to just 15%, you see that takes a real hit to the um, um, high performer uh, turnover. And the system, again, says, yes, we really like that. You need to really jack that up going forward. Um, and you get to the point where... Um, high performer turnover actually gets down to lower than it was at the beginning of the period uh, before the um, acquisition. So it's an idea where you can take uh, um, HR, HRIS, talent, financial, all of this, put it into one and see how you're going to better your business through um, people analytics. Um, so that's kind of the uh, best of the demo. I'm going to try and go back to PowerPoint, see if it'll work for me and just uh, uh, finish off the um, presentation and ask a few questions. Uh, so uh, uh, let me look and see if um, I have any questions. Looks like I have a few. Um, 
Here's a good question. What are embedded analytics? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I always like to make the joke, the difference between a good question and a great question is you can answer a great question. Um, so that's a great question. Embedded analytics where are essentially um, what we've been showing is all of the analytics um, on a dashboard. Embedded analytics so would actually take those individual analytics and snapshots and everything, and you would actually put it into the application, possibly at the particular phase. So you might be doing a performance review, take your uh, performance analytics and put it at a, into the performance uh, software actually at the point where it have the most relevance. So it actually is a pretty good use of the solution. Uh, we find kind of a mix of uh, people wanting it all in one place on a dashboard versus having it in the system. Uh, but it's, it's very useful in either places. Um, another question, can you build predictive models outside of turnover? Absolutely. Um, probably the two areas where we do the most predictive modeling are the areas where there's the most movement, and that's in recruiting and uh, terminations. So you're at a point where, you know, every month you have your particularly large companies are recruiting people um, and losing them. So that's where we do most of our predictive modeling. But we've done some really uh, interesting ones around uh, analyzing uh, absences and how that affects productivity. Uh, also um, around a lot of these talent statistics over, you know, what's the impact of not having successors? Uh, you, you, read, uh, uh, you read stories all the time about large organizations who lose a, a president or an executive vice president. The search takes five months to replace them. Uh, so um, all of those can have dramatic effects. Um, can you pull data from Workday? Yes, uh, Workday, we, we, we can pull data from any source. I think I actually showed Workday in the demonstration. But yes, that's one of our more, uh, more prominent systems that we pull data from. Um, and then it looks like I got one last question. Uh, what's a good source for benchmark data? Well, it depends on what the benchmark data is that you're actually looking for. Um, I would probably, if, if you've done nothing with uh, benchmark data so far, I would advise going to SHRM. Uh, SHRM, uh, SHRM, because uh, they also ha they have a lot of free top line data, um, so you could probably get a basket of very good metrics of you know what's the average time to fill an industry, what's um, you know average turnover. Um, <clears throat> probably the one that's most specific is the one that I showed here, uh, which is uh, salary benchmark data. You usually have to go to a specialist to get that. Um, there's ones out there like Salary.com, Mercer. Um, Aon. Uh, actually, if you could get on the mailing list for Robert Half, they actually send out by industry um, uh, a salary survey document every year. Um, I get ones for legal, finance, manufacturing, construction, all of them. Um, and they're pretty good. They go down to some uh, uh, pretty detailed job descriptions uh, where you can actually you know, make very good use of the data. Um, uh, probably cover 80% of your employees from that. So if you wanted to look for a good source there, that would be a would be a good one. So um, any other questions before I sign off? You can send through the chat there. I don't know if I actually told people that's the best place to um, to actually uh, send questions is through the chat. Um, so, but if you're um, through with that, uh, I will then move on and. Uh, just closing out here, um, again, I'm Tom McEwen. I'm the CEO. If you want to contact me after the demonstration, just send it to Tom at trenddata.com. My personal um, Twitter is at Tom McEwen if you want to follow me. And I do have a blog outside of Trend Data, Um If you want to follow Trend Data, uh, you can just send an email to marketing at trenddata.com for any kind of queries. If you'd like a further demonstration or like to talk more about the solution, um, our Twitter handle is uh, at Trend Data Inc. And our website, if you want to um, see any of our past recorded webinars, uh, we have a library there of about uh, probably 15 to 20 webinars we've done over the last two years, uh, as well as uh, other uh, little snapshot videos of a two minute look at the, the product and solution and other stuff on our website that uh, if you're looking at going down this people analytics road can be very, um, very um, useful. So. That being the case, I uh, would like to thank everybody for their time today. And uh, as I said, we'll be this webinar has been recorded, so hopefully we can clean out those parts where PowerPoint failed. But uh, 
uh, we will um, put this up on our website probably in the next uh, two or three days. So thank you again for your time and uh, hope to get together and speak again soon.